come to give a talk there, and uh, where he was also awarded the he was given the best student uh, award, the student paper award uh, for this paper. And uh, <coughs> he is right now currently a PhD candidate in the uh, University of New Mexico's uh, Electrical Engineering Department. He is probably close to finishing uh, his thesis and his uh, interests are in optimization and stochastic control. And uh, besides the best paper in ACM uh, last year, he has also, he got the best uh, student hardware project award, Professor Achim Bob Price for his uh, MTech work. So with that I will uh, hand it over to you. Thank you for the invitation, Professor Bresbai. Hello everyone, welcome to my talk. Um, as he's always said, I'm a fourth year PhD student working at the University of New Mexico. Sorry. Uh, my advisor is uh, Professor Miko Oishi. Um, my work is essentially on stochastic reachability, which is about pro giving probabilistic guarantees of safety for autonomous systems. So today I'll be talking about the scalable implementations for the same, and that is, essentially has applications in multiple fields. So. To begin with, when I say autonomy, what I mean is having a computer drive a dynamical system to achieve some objective, be it an autopilot in an aircraft or the promise of a self-driving car. Autonomy has the power of simplifying our lives a lot and helping us become more efficient. We also see autonomy in spacecraft rendezvous problem where you have two spacecrafts and you want to drive them together so that they meet and then you can do repairs or transfer goods. We also see autonomy in biomedical devices. Recently, there was an automated anesthesia delivery system which was released, which essentially allows you to bring down the cost by dele delegating the work of an anesthesiologist to an automated system. And then you have autonomous surveillance where you have a core rotor which you want to track a moving target in an urban environment. And you have power grid which is massive and you cannot hope for a human operator to comprehend the entire system and then essentially manage it. So autonomous systems is powerful, but when we design, decide to delegate work to autonomous systems, we naturally require safety guarantees. We, after all, do not want to drive a sit, we sit in a self-driving car where the, it has a high probability of causing an accident. We want assurances that the system will behave as expected and will always perform the way we want it. And as control theorists, the way we attack this problem is through mathematical models. Now, real-world problems generally are stochastic and high-dimensional. Why stochastic? You need stochastic components to essentially model human behavior with some probability a driver would turn right or turn left, or you would have disturbing effects. Like in an autopilot system, you have the weather cloud moving the uh, atmosphere in a random manner. And then you would have unmodeled phenomenon. Like in the spacecraft, there, there are a lot of external forces, which if we more start modeling, the system would become extremely complicated. So to account for unmodeled systems, also we would use stochastic random variables. And on the other hand, you, these real-world problems are high-dimensional because you would want high model fidelity. You want to accurately represent the uh, real-world phenomena in your mathematical model. So our problem is to essentially do give safety guarantee systems for a stochastic system with high dimensionality. What we are after is to maximize the probability of safety and essentially find those good initial states from which the autonomous controller can drive you towards, uh, or try, try can drive you towards a target while remaining safe. So what I mean by this is, I'll cast a safety problem as a stochastic reachable problem, which is given a stochastic system and a safe set, this blue area and a target area, which is the dark blue area. You have an initial state, and you want to find that autonomous controller that essentially drives you towards the target at a specified time while we always ensuring the system lies inside a safe set. So for example, this initial is not good because the best autonomous controller, for example, can only keep you safe up to a point and not allow you to reach the target. Also, given a probability threshold, let's say 0.999, we also want to characterize a set of initial states which satisfy this property. That is the stochastic reach avoid set. So this class of problems is called a verification problem. And it's, it lies in the intersection of control theory and computer science, and it's been an active area of research for the past few decades. Specifically, the stochastic reachable problem has a nice stochastic optimal control theory based solution using dynamic programming to solve this problem. However, to implement it, it's hard when it is a high dimensional system because you would have the curse of dimensionality. What I mean by that would become clear in a couple of slides. 
So essentially, this talk would focus on scalable verification, which is an open question and which we have made some progress, not complete progress yet, to answer this problem and provide good tractable solutions. So before I continue, let me uh, highlight my major contributions of my PhD work. My two main areas of which I worked on are scalable methods for assuring safety and also on user interface synthesis. In for the scalable methods, I've essentially tackled the problem using full transforms and corner optimization, which is what allows us to give, get this tractability and scalability to high dimensions, which was not achieved before. I've also worked on integrating these techniques into motion planning. So today I'll be talking about specifically the forward stochastic reachability problem, which is given an initial state, we are trying to characterize what the stochastic of the state would be in future and use that information as well as corner optimization to solve the verification problem I was talking about, the stochastic reach world problem. And I'll talk about not all of my work, some of my work in motion planning, specifically on surveillance as well as spacecraft on the world docking. So as far as my talk is concerned, I'll talk first, set up the problem, and then uh, discuss the forward stochastic reachability where I'll use Fourier transforms. And then I will apply this method to stochastic verification, and then conclude and provide some future research directions. So system formulation is standard. I'll be restricting to LTS systems and I'll try to comment on wherever things can be extended to nonlinear systems and more complicated systems. So for LTA, I consider a discrete time LTS system with a st no, given state space, a set U, a set of input, space, uh, input actions available, um, a disturbance set, and the disturbance set specifically is stochastic disturbance with a known probability density functions, small side of A. So an important thing in this work as it is, is this set U need not be unbounded. It, uh, in reality, you cannot expect your control actions to allow you to have infinity. Generally, the way control theory tries to handle is through saturation functions. We provide an alternative method, which is through continuous optimization. And this kind of formulation is naturally, uh, um, can be transformed into a Markov decision process with this specific uh, transition probability function. That is psi w of y minus ax, which basically gives you the probability of trans, uh, if you are at state x and you apply the action u, what is the probability that you would lie at a state y? Um, and under this frame formulation, so all this is basically an already existing work which is talking about a stochastic optimal control theory based solution for the stochastic each word problem. So there, they also proposed a Markov policy, which is essentially a state feedback law. So for, at every time instant, given a state, you would get, you would be told to apply this control action. And under this Markov policy, we will see that the random vector capital X. So each of the state now is a random vector because of the disturbance. If you concern it into a huge random vector, X1, X2, X3, X, all the way to the time horizon, capital N, you would have a random vector defined in the state space, uh, in the probability space, Xn, the state space power, quite artisan product N times, a Borel sigma algebra of Xn. So a Borel set is basically a union of a union or intersection or related complements of open sets. Those are the sets in which it's well defined to talk about probability of a random vector lying inside that set. So this is the collection of all those sets, and then a probability measure which, which is parameterized by your initial state and the Markov policy which you apply. So essentially, if you are given an initial state and a known Markov policy, that is. Uh, look out there and imagine a lookup table under this uh, at this time at this state you do this action if those two are given to you you can essentially uh, talk about what the probability of this capital x would be of it lying inside the set so now the formally the stochastic teacher word problem is as follows given two parallel sets safe set and a target set we want to maximize the probability of lie capital x lying inside the set why that why is that it's because a uh, stochastic reach word problem is as follows. You want your interest rate to lie in the safe set, your x1 to lie in the safe set, x2 to lie in the safe set, all the way till xn minus 1 to lie in the safe set, and your x at the time horizon lie in the target set. So this is the probability you want to maximize, and we, uh, we, have, we have a constraint that our Markov policy should lie inside the set of admissible Markov policies. So this is where a bounded control action constraint comes about. So the solution for this is essentially by writing a probability as expectation of product of indicator functions. And this is where the departure from a standard Markov uh, decision process happens. Generally in Markov decision process, you have a summative cost function, 
where as we as you see here we have a product of cost a, a product a multiplicative cost function and the solution for this is at the same time using dynamic programming where you have equations based on dynamic programming principle and then we essentially can compute theoretically the value functions over time and the value function at time zero would be the probability of achieving this reach over objective however to implement it you would have to discretize uh, the state space and that's where the cursor dimensionality comes in and at that point it's um, known that you uh, most uh, the largest dimension system you can handle is three dimensional the moment you go to the fourth dimension the amount of good points you have reaches exponentially and becomes intractable. So is uh, N, uh, isn't <coughs> there any requirement on capital N to be as small as possible and so on, or what, what do you normally do with that? So uh, here, uh, the, um, for the, this dynamic program we put, there's no restriction on capital N. So we, uh, because so all you have to do is keep on iteratively going backwards. I see. So you'll try to search for, even N will come out as... Uh, so if, if, uh, your N is initialized as your, this is indicated target set, Right. And then you would basically say, so this is essentially the conditional expectation. So right. what is the probability that you would in future lie in your target set while if you are at this point and then keep on doing this iteratively. So if you have n as a huge number, you'll have a lot of value functions to compute. But then at the, uh, the computation time depends um, polynomially on n. It depends exponentially on the uh, dimensionality. That's why the cursor dimensionality is more and more important than the time of SN. So if you were doing to go to a competition, so my question is like, do you also search for n? You you try various ends and see because some ends, smaller ends, it might not even be feasible. Yes. Might not be yes. feasible. So uh, for that problem, there's an alternative formulation which is called the first hitting time horizon, okay. where you are not interested in hitting at a specific time, but as early as possible. So that's an alternative formulation, and it also has a dynamic programming solution. But my work has been always focused on this because this, as you will see, has much more good structure than the other one. So you assume some fixed time. Fixed time, yes. So this is, for example, relevant if you know uh, you for the biomedical case, you know the length of your operation. So uh, if you have an automated anesthesia problem, you know you want to bring the patient's sedation level. That's the dynamic system over there. The patient's sedation level has a well, a kinematic model for it, and the automated anesthesia gives the anesthesia a bolus to it. So you want at a specific time the station, patient sedation level to be so much, and you want the patient sedation level to be within some bounds. Over sedation would mean they'll go into coma, less sedation means they might wake up in the operation. So that, that's the kind of problem which this would be applicable. No restriction capital T, right? Uh, capital T. Um, so, for implement uh, uh, this as it is, the dynamic program solution theoretically has no restriction. It just borders that. But to start implementing it, you need these restrictions. Your yeah, input space S and D all have to be compact. Can it be a point also? Yeah. If, uh, the problem is when you talk about probability, if you play at a point, you will have probability zero. Uh, but apart from that, um, if you, talk, for example, talk about discrete transition function, then it's totally valid. So, um, as we're talking about the stochastic reach over set, that is the set of initial conditions is good, will be given as the theta super level set of a value function. So, the value function will tell you at a given initial state, this is the probability of achieving this reach over objective, that is staying within the safe set while eventually reaching this target set. Taking a super level set of theta above it will give you all those points for which the probability is greater than theta. So, our goal. Uh, for this uh, work was basically to come up with an under approximation for this. Why under approximation? Because you do not want to over approximate your probability of safety. If your if system actually has 80% probability of safety and you come up and say it's 90% probability of safety, then it's, it's strong. Whereas if you if we can at least say it's at least safe as 60%, then that's useful information. Then we can use that to pro probably design, move our uh, design uh, process. So to make all these concepts clear, I just thought I'll give a small example. So think of a double integrator system. Double integrator system is essentially the model of the point mass. You have a position, and then it's double derivative acceleration, and you have control on the acceleration. So if you sample at a sampling time Ts, and then you add Wt, for example, for friction. In this case, I was, I was thinking um, you have a car which is restricted to stay on a lane, and you want to stop within some boundary. And you, you can either go forward some acceleration, uh, you can decelerate to up to some point. So that's why in my safe set and my target set is for simplicity a minus one to minus one box. So in this case, the states are position and the velocity of the car, 
acceleration is what I can control, which is the input, and the WT is a, a disturbance, which is to model friction, let's say. So by doing this dynamic programming, what you end up with is a value function that looks like this. It actually makes sense because you have, it basically says if you at R the origin and at zero velocity, you will be safe. Because you are not moving, you, are, you don't have to apply any input, you'll continue to be there. And even if the friction causes you to do something, it will go. What's the dimension of WT? WT is two. That's not realistic. The position is kinematic state, you cannot have noise on that. Yeah, so this is, I'm just giving you some motivation again, just to make it clear. So um, if you feel uh, not convinced about the example in the real world, just feel free to do it. I just wanted to say. It's much more useful to have a V matrix like that, whatever you put in AT, yeah. something there like zero one sort of thing, and then it makes sense. Yeah, uh, you could do that also, and then the L function would look slightly different. Um, but okay, so let's say this. For this dynamics, this would be the value function which you would get. And the key idea I wanted, wanted, to, wanted to point out was if you start taking super level sets, that is, you take cross section and then look about all those points that are above it, those would give you the uh, stochastic feature void set. So those would be the set of states for which you are safe. This color uh, graph kind of shows you how the stochastic feature void sets would look like. So for the forward stochastic reachability, the problem is to predict. So this is where I'm going to switch the gears a bit. So here, earlier I was talking so far about Markov policies, that is your state feedback law. But now if you restrict yourself to only open loop policies, that is given an initial state, you be blindly apply an input, sequence of input actions. If for that um, kind of an open loop policy, we can show that the probability measure and the probability density um, of the state, capital X, the whole random vector, has good form, good uh, properties and good analytical forms. So uh, that would be in the first part of my talk. And there, at that point, your probability space, for example, would be slightly different because now it would be parameterized by the open loop policy as opposed to a Markov policy. And this is specifically um, for, at, at time tau, it will be uh, something like that. Um, and what we are interested in is, is given those initial conditions, like if you're at this point, uh, what we are interested in is essentially come up with those set of states for which there's some non-zero probability of occurrence and the corresponding density. So that, that is what the forward stochastic reachability problem deals with. So now to relate this or put this in the context of the existing work, as I already mentioned, this entire theory builds on stochastic optimal control and stochastic optimal control is partially synonymous with Markov distribution process. So a lot of good work has happened. One of the major stumbling blocks which we face in this <laughs> Transferring that to, to the safety problem is because of the multiplicative cost function. So for the, the original dynamic programming solution was proposed by Professor Abate and like Rose's group. But because it was realized that the cursor dimensionality hurts implementing this technique into real world problem, a lot of approximation techniques have been proposed. We have particle filter approximations, um, there is convex chance constraint approximation, um, and there's also an approximation dynamic programming based approach where you use for example, sum of squares to polynomially approximate your value function. But all of these uh, tend to not scale well, like the highest dimensionality so far reported was 12. And uh, our technique essentially can push uh, scalability as high as 40 dimensions. So that allows us to bring now things like chord rotors, you have multiple chord rotors, you can start pairing them up and things like that. Though we have not started exploring that yet, it's there on my to-do list. Um, and then um, for stochastic reachability, uh, essentially uh, people have realized that you can use convolutions to do this approach. By convolutions specifically because if you have an additive noise function, you are summing up two random variables, which is basically whose densities would convolve. But um, as far as I know, people do not go for the next step. That is you can use Fourier transforms to actually do things better if you are able to digest the restriction that we are doing in linear systems. For non-linear systems, convolution is the only approach I know of so far. But if you have an additive noise and linear system, then we can go to the Fourier transform domain to come up with closed form expressions, which I'll short, discuss shortly. So all this so far is in discrete time. In continuous time, the entire problem becomes even further harder because of the measurability problems which you start having. You have to start dealing with stochastic integrals, and people are continuously working on it, um, but it, it, it has a lot, a lot of problems as it is. An alternative perspective in this problem is uh, to talk about differential game freedom, where as opposed to stochastic reachability, we try to come up with what is the worst case disturbance action. So this naturally forms into a differential game framework, and you can compose a Hamilton-Jacobi-Isaacs formulation, 
which would be a partial differential equation which we just solved, we will be able to come up with the conservative point from which you get guaranteed to be safe. So, so far all these guarantees are probabilistic in the sense that this is, you have 80% probability of safety or 90% probability of safety. The uncertain systems approach, they give you exact certainty. But as you can expect, if you have a Gaussian disturbance, the, this set would be empty. Similarly, if you have a human automation collaborative system, this formulation would not be appropriate because at that point you would be treating the human as an adversary, which may not be in the reality of the case. There would be some human error, which is better model as a stochastic element rather than an um, a disturbance element which needs to be robust to fight against. Um, so I'll just quickly go to a couple of preliminaries, preliminaries but then <coughs> feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, so two things that, as I said, I will use will be Cornell's optimization and Fourier transform. So I thought it would be good to have one slide to talk what Cornell's optimization is. So Cornell's optimization is minimizing a convex function over a convex set. So what's a convex function? A convex function is a function, if you take any two points, and draw a, a high hyperplane passing through those two. The entire function would be below it, or all the points that it joins here. So there's an Jensen's inequality which mathematically relates those two. Um, and then a concave function would be a negative of that. So why is convex optimization important? It allows you to make the statement. Every local optima which you find for this problem would automatically be a global optima, which is good because generally optimization approaches are through gradient descent algorithms which are guaranteed only to find local optima. But if you have this convexity property, you can be satisfied with that. Because now you have a certificate that even though if you, uh, you don't have a guarantee of finding all the optima, what you have found would be at least at par with any other optima you can find. And a convex set is basically a, a set where if you take into points, you draw a line, that entire line would always be inside the set. If you, you could have a non-convex set, which an example of that would be like this. And a polytope specifically is a specific form of a convex set where you we can describe it exactly using a bunch of inequalities. So it's an intersection of a bunch of half spaces. Uh, and one more important property which I'll be using is log concavity. Log concavity is nothing but if you have a function, if you take a log of it, that would be concave. That's it. It's important because generally a lot of st uh, statistic um, distributions have log concavity property. For example, exponential is log concave, Gaussian distribution is log concave, and I'll be using that property a lot today. The other uh, uh, concept which I'll be using will be Fourier transforms in probability theory. So in probability theory, Fourier transforms are, or characteristic functions are always defined for any PDF. This is because a density function is guaranteed to be in L1, it's absolutely integrable which automatically means a Fourier transform would exist. And given a Fourier transform, you can uniquely find uh, the probability density function by taking its inverse Fourier transform. The useful properties of this is basically the affine transformation allows you to have an analytical expression for the characteristic function. That is, if you have a characteristic function of director W, if you take an affine transformation and make it into V, we have a closed form expression of how the characteristic function of V would look like in terms of W. And also the independent random vectors would have product in the probability function and the characteristic functions. So with this, um, I have the three problems I want to discuss would be this. Compute the forward probability, um, stochastic reach forward density. That's the forward stochastic reachability problem. And then we'll use that to under approximate the stochastic reach award problem. And then we, using these two concepts, we will um, essentially you um, under approximate stochastic reach over set. Specifically, I'll be discussing a polytope representation for that, which is good because you could now talk about uh, things like uh, if you have motion planning problem, it's nice to have things already in a polytope format, so you can directly plug it in in your optimization solver. So uh, now I'll go to the first model. Is there any questions so far? Okay. So uh, for stochastic reachability, as I've already mentioned, is and trying to answer the question, what's the probability that a state would lie in a given set at some time to come? Applications would be in stochastic target capture, something like surveillance, or in stochastic obstacle avoidance. So the key idea which we use is the fact that because we have restricted ourselves to linear time invariant systems, and we have an affine disturbance, we can write the state at time tau in this format. It's, it's, it's a, uh, the system matrix power tau, times the controllability matrix with respect to input and the speed disturbance. So as you can see here, if you know the uh, open loop policy which you are applying and we have the initial state, this is nothing but an affine transformation of the disturbance vector W, the entire uh, W1, W2, all the way to W 
tau uh, tau tau minus one. Um, it's a fine transformation to x tau. So as I already mentioned that the characteristic function allows for an analytical expression for this transformation. The way we can compute the density of the state at time tau would be as follows. Given the joint density function of this capital W, compute its Fourier transform, which will give you the characteristic function. Apply this affine transformation to come up with um, the characteristic function of psi x, and then take an inverse Fourier transform. And at this point, we can see that this approach is essentially grid-free and recursion-free. So that is, uh, instead of having a, at every time set, you do something, uh, compute this probability density. We can directly start at time zero, go to time five, time ten. Whatever time is of interest, we can use the corresponding equation that gives you the state, and then compute this uh, transform. Also, if you have an additional restriction that the noise is IID, then we start off with the density of the disturbance, and we can use a property that the characteristic functions are product of the individual uh, density disturbances. So this allows us to essentially start from here to compute the characteristic function of the small a single disturbance, use that to compute the capital W, the W vector disturbance characteristic function, and then apply this transformation to compute the characteristic function of the state and then the inverse Fourier transform. So this entire block, which I was mentioning, allows for closed form expressions. So if you start off with, for example, a Gaussian density, then the characteristic function of a Gaussian density is well known. We start off with an exponential, it's well known. All standard distributions have a well uh, a standardized uh, Fourier transform. So essentially, we have a closed form expression for this block. Then IID is basically product of uh, closed form expressions. And then affine transformation also permits a closed form expression. So we have essentially a closed form expression up to this point, provided you have a standard dis disturbance. And then the problem is to compute the inverse Fourier transform. So this is a computational challenge because this. This inverse Fourier transform is a small and dimensional integration. Its, it's dimensionality depends on the state of the dimension. So um, if you have n way as very large, then you would have to worry about multi-dimensional quadrature, and that wouldn't be a problem. But if you uh, most of the problems, you can also transform. Um, like what is of interest is integration, not density as it is, the integration of density over a set. Because what we are not really you, um, in, uh, requiring the density information as it is. What we are the more info, useful question is to ask: What is the probability that the state will lie inside some set? And that would be basically the integration of this over some set, which has an equivalent representation of the Fourier transform by our Planzfeld's theorem. That is, if you have product of two functions, its integration is, uh, is the same as the product of this corresponding Fourier transforms and their integration. So, because we have a closed form expression for this. You can compute the closed form expression for the um, the set, integrate from that set. If you have a box, its full transform would be a sink, or something like that. And then you can essentially avoid doing two in, uh, quadratures and just have true one quadrature. And once we have the density, computing the probability measure is uh, straightforward. For any Borel set, we can compute this set. So uh, for an application, let me discuss the stochastic target capture problem, which is as follows. You have a goal robot G and robot R. The robot R has a, some set which it can reach. So this is a deterministic forward reach. And go, robo, goal G uh, robot has a density, which is given by psi G. What we are interested in is finding that optimal location of capture for robot R. So the capture probability is defined as the density of robot um, goal G at time tau to lie inside a capture set centered about the robot R. So this is our objective function. We want to maximize this capture probability while choosing an XR which is inside this reachable set. We don't want to pick this point, which is, which definitely would be the mean, will have higher probability, but not necessarily achieve or feasible. And what is interesting is this function, the capture probability, is known to be lock and key if we have a log concave disturbance and a convex capture set. So log concavity, if you recall, is log of that function would be a concave function. So the operation problem would be as follows. Maximize over what time at which to capture, because even that's a, a, a flexible parameter, and what state to capture. The objective subject to time lying inside the time horizon and your XR of tau lying inside the reach set. So this is the probability of capture, and this is the state set of states which robot R can reach. And this um, can be transformed into a problem as follows. That is, if you specify a specific time of instant, 
then and then we transform this objective at minus log, we essentially end up with a convex problem. So we have this convex problem at every time instant, which you can solve very efficiently in basically a matter of milliseconds or maybe seconds. And then um, you will take a finite max over multiple time instances. So uh, just a question. Yeah. So just go back. So uh, so you have to kind of figure out the control action u, right? So that's so, actually encoded inside the reach r. Okay. So the reach r basically uh, the, it's a determined reach or it's a reach set which tells you for every state, final state, this is the action which you apply. So uh, moment we pick xr, the corresponding control automatically becomes state final. Um, because it basically means that there is a control which will take you there, and then you just ma it's a matter okay, of following. Every time step is all this optimization problem. Okay. Yes. So uh, we basically, um, I'll get to the experimental validation. We validated this experiment on quad rotors. Um, so before that, let me just quickly give you some simulation results so that it might become a bit more clear. So this graph basically shows you have point mass robot uh, and a point mass gold. So as you can expect, as time increases, the density spreads because you're not bringing any new information to the problem. You're just propagating the stochasticity from the initial state. And the, ro the robot R reach set, the set, the set of states it can reach grows on over time. And it tries to maximize or place this red box, the capture set, in, at the point where the probability of capture is maximum. So an interesting thing that came out, and that's basically by playing this parameter, is the maximum capture probability happens at tau equal to five. And at tau equal to five, as you can see, the blue box, the reach set, is not able to capture the mean. So generally, for a Gaussian disturbance systems, you would expect, okay, track the mean and you will be able to do optimally, you achieve optimality. But for this problem, as you can see, mean actually is covered only at time t equal to six, by which time the density spreads so far that the probability of capture actually decreases. So, and all this problem essentially took or 1.6 uh, seconds to compute the density and 5.3 seconds to do this entire simulation. And this is now I don't not exploiting any parallelization, but as you can expect, all these individual problems are parallel, can be parallelly implemented. So there's nothing at scary forward between time t equal to one and t equal to two. So if you, for example, have 20 computer clusters, then you can at the same time solve these 20 problems and then combine the solution, which will give you faster solution, uh, fast results. Well, doesn't look like a little bit stochastic, right? I mean, it just looks very deterministic. So the, the black line is the trajectory of the mean, and mm -hmm. the, these contour plots show the density of the mean. So actually, um, we do not know, for example, where the robot G would actually be. So it's inside that zone. It, it, exactly, it's inside that. So we know we, with the Fourier transforms, we're exactly able to capture the stochasticity. We know this is the exact density function, and then we're using that to maximize the probability of capture. And then we also did this for an exponential disturbance, so, um, where now the robot R is st uh, still a point mass and robot G is a double integrator, the earlier example I was talking about, with an exponential disturbance too. And at this point, first of all, the mean cannot be tracked because mean of an exponential disturbance is not its mode, uh, the probability of maximum occurrence. So as you can see, with the black trajectory goes, the mean goes like this, whereas the mode is somewhere else, the contour plots are slightly off from the mean. And our optimization problem still solve, computes this, uh, and then comes up with the best place to go and capture it. At this point, um, you will see that the, the FSRPD takes much more longer. And that's because for exponential disturbance, we cannot have a close sum experiment for the density. And at this point, we are now getting the realm of multidimensional quadrature. So that's why you have a larger tech. Um, and that's why even the total computation time is high. But what I wanted to highlight is this method is not restricted to cautions. It, it can be applied to any disturbances, basically. And for experimental validation, we did this work in collaboration with Sandia, where they were interested, Sandia National Lab is an organization just like DRDO, back in the US. And um, they basically were interested in using quad rotors for doing surveillance. So they have an unknown uh, aerial vehicle coming into an area which needs to be protected. And because quadrators generally have a very thin uh, cross section, radars will not be able to cap uh, surveil it properly. So the idea was to actually send out quadrators to do the surveillance for, uh, or actually enhance the surveillance capabilities. So at this point, we basically have a team of quadrators, which basically have to. Um, we want to. We know at some point this is where the quadrator was last seen. We have some model for the quadrator, the so dynamics and we want to maximize the capture, uh, probability of capture. 
So this would be the optimization problem. And we essentially you, uh, implement this in a receding horizon control framework, which provided this robustness to the model uncertainty. Whatever model which we propose for the unknown border, you know, we are right. It would be finally driven by a human or some uh, model which, isn't, which you don't have access to. So this receding horizon, receding horizon framework essentially gave us the robustness to that. And we validated it with one quarter. Let me just play this. Um, so this work is right now submitted to ACC. Uh, who's, we don't know, know if it will be accepted yet. We're waiting for its results. So the idea is you have a threat, which threat trajectory deviates from the what the model predicts, and the robots are, um, uh, or the pursuer in this case, has a receiving horizon control that's updated at three hertz to capture this. So we have an asset to which the model says it will go there, whereas it's actually driven by a human and does not do what the model says, but still the pursuer can go and capture it. So let me let you guys see this. So right now, the green is the is the threat, okay. and the threat right on the pursuer. And um, we're doing this in real time. There's no offline computation. At the real time, it's computing. It's we have, we have icon system which tells where the threat is, and from that information, real time, it computes where to go and intercept. So I have not had that we brought this video, but we basically had a thread move it, like we're holding hands by holding on a hand, then move it towards right. The person will correspondingly go and track it and things like that as well. So um, in the experiment I showed, the model is actually saying it will go towards an uh, asset in the shortest possible manner, and the person is trying to defend it essentially. And it basically says this is where we should go at this point, and this would be the capture set for that. So, so just a question on that, in the uh, the state of the target is being measured continuously every time step, right? Yes. So so you are also, the pursuer will estimate the state, you also have an estimation type. Thing. Yeah, so the, our estimation is basically from this model. So we we say the, uh, the pursuer will actually do, a uh, threat will actually have an LQR-like formulation to go towards the asset. It's always solving the form, uh, optimal control problem and coming over that trajectory. But that's not what the threat will actually do. Uh, it will be doing something different. But because you're doing it in a receding horizon manner, it essentially is able to um, be robust to that uh, difference in the models, basically. So um, now the second part is where we'll use this technique to solve the original problem which we're after, the stochastic reach word problem. So just to recap, the original problem was to maximize the probability of safety while subject to Markov policies. Now, the under approximation is by basically, instead of searching over the Markov policies, search over the open loop policies. So as we can intuitively expect, because we are not doing a state feedback, whatever probability of safety which you can achieve with this open loop policy is guaranteed to be smaller than the uh, probability of safety which you can achieve with a state feedback law. Hence, this is given, uh, and this we showed um, formally in the, this paper. And what we now have is a value function and an under approximation for it. So, so essentially we can now compute an under approximation for this, this safety problem by solving this optimization problem. That is maximize the probability of capital X lying inside the reach of it, um, cube and while the open loop control policy lies inside the set of um, open loop actions possible. So, as for, uh, earlier, we now have the same um, approach to compute this density. That is because this problem which we want to solve is equivalent to basically solving maximizing the integration of the density over this set with a capital U vector, which is the all the input actions you must apply from time one all the way to time n minus time zero to ten n minus one, um, and that should lie inside U n. So if we can compute this density, then we just need to integrate this and then solve this optimization problem. So this was the flow chart which I showed earlier for the forward side reachability. It just needs to be tweaked slightly. That is now, if you want to, um, you can write in a closed form expression the capital X vector as follows. That is, it's A bar where um, A bar, H bar, and G bar are actually stacks of the old, earlier matrices which we had. And then we can again compute this density and then compute this integral. So this essentially allows us to do a grid-free and a regression-free under approximation. So earlier, the dynamic programming approach had a recursion-based um, approach and required grid. And that was those two reasons why we had lack of scalability. And this approach now does not need a grid or a recursion. So what we have essentially achieved is 
transform the cost of dimensionality, the need on a, for a grid, into a problem of now a small end capital and dimensional quadrature. So this is no, no longer, uh, not, I'm not saying it's an easy problem, it's still harder, but this is a much more well known problem. There are Monte Carlo methods to solve, uh, to compute this integration or uh, important sampling, a uh, lot of techniques. So we can now use that techniques to now solve, compute this objective and then solve this problem. Moreover, moreover for LTA systems uh, with caution disturbance, this problem is a log concave optimization problem, which now means that we are, if you take a log of this objective, we actually have a convex problem, which means now we can apply gradient methods to come up with an um, optimal solution. However, because in uh, multi-dimensional quadrature problem, this objective would generally be noisy. And that essentially means you have to now uh, depend on what solver you choose. For Gaussian specifically, this is basically integration of a Gaussian over a polytope, if you have a polytopic safe set and a target set. And that for that, there is a <coughs> known algorithm, Gensel. So, So uh, using this Gens algorithm, we can basically compute this objective and then we can solve this problem efficiently. So this was the major result which we got, that is the early dynamic programming basically blew up. This is a log uh, scale, uh, log or y plot. <coughs> and, with, and the system is a chain of integrators. So as we increase the dimension of integration, our approach essentially scales much better compared to a dynamic programming approach. And this scalability is primarily due to the convexity result which I showed and then poor transforms. So for the double integrator case I was talking about earlier, this was a plot I showed you earlier where you had um, a point mass inside a box. Dynamic programming, we get this result. If you do a poor transform plus pattern search, which is a solver in MATLAB, which essentially does global optimization, gradient free solver and we can use that to essentially under approximate the value function. We also tried using the fmin call and because it's a gradient based uh, optimization solver and we, we have a noisy objective, it can get stuck in a lot of local optima and that's why the under approximation is worse compared to pattern search. So in this we saw that the fmin con takes small, lower computation time because you can get stuck in local optima and then say that I have solved it, this all the problem. The pattern test takes, at the cost of uh, more computational cost, it can solve for a better optimality. And the, the relative error, which I've showed here, it's a value function, this minus the value optimal under approximation. As you can see, the large part of the state space, the relative error is about 0.2. So this is relative error, is, again, uh, is under approximation, so it's okay to have an error, um, and it does not give you a wrong information. When you use fmincon, the error is much more worse. It's why these white areas is basically because the value function over here is already is almost zero, and therefore it basically returns an, an NAND number there. And it blows up, the error blows up in these corners because even the value functions are quite small, the value over there. So at that point, when you have relative error of, let's say, 0 0.01 also, the error blows up at that point. But for a large part of the state, the state space, it's uh, good. So with this, we can now under approximate to actually reach our problem. That is, given an initial point, I'll come up with the under approximation for the probability of safety. Now I'll use that technique to come up with a stochastic reach avoid set. So the stochastic reach avoid set is basically a super level set of the original value function. We'll come up with a new set of k, which is the super level set of the new optimal value function, our under approximation. So the idea is if we can make, uh, if we can guarantee that this set is convex and compact, then that set has a tight polytopic under approximation. Uh, I'll show, it to you, show you why. Think of an ellipsoid, and if you have a point, let's say this is the center of the ellipsoid, and then you pick this point. If you draw out vectors from it, then we can essentially take the convex hull at where the vectors meet the boundary. And this would be a tight polytopic under approximation because if you now increase the number of vectors, the new polytopic under approximation would contain the original under approximation. So as essentially, as you increase the direction vectors which you choose, the polytopic under approximation will tightly under approximate your original set. And as I mentioned, under approximation is what we need because we are discussing safety problems. So with that in mind, basically uh, we showed that under some conditions, we can guarantee these sets to be close and compact and if uh, also convex. 
so with these conditions uh, we basically uh, can now come up with a compact uh, apolylobic under approximation for the reach avoid set so our uh, this is the optimal value function for our under approximation note that we don't have access to this entire function at every point we can run solve the optimal problem and compute the corresponding w naught what we need is a method that will be grid free to compute this level set so if the starting point is if you have let's say um, a point um, if you want to we can easily compute the maximum value of this step it's because that's because it's an unconstrained optimization problem we simply maximize the probability of safety irrespective of where the state is and that lets you compute this um, maximum value and that's again lock on cave problem so that can can come through very quickly and we come once we have this problem given any threshold value to us let's say we are given two values beta and alpha so beta is greater than this and uh, the maximum value the optimal value can attain uh, the under approximation can attain and alpha is smaller than that we clearly see that for uh, the uh, um, under approximation of the super stochastic reach about set for level b uh, theta value beta would be empty because our under approximation cannot reach at that uh, higher threshold and if we have a um, value less than the max then we have a non empty reach over set and what we interested in is computing an polytopic under approximation for that and the way we do it is basically we know that the maximum value would be contained inside the set so start from that point draw out vectors and then essentially do a bisection along this vector direction to compute this boundary uh, this boundary point and the bisection is guaranteed to give you the boundary um, the boundary point specifically because we have the log concavity and then we repeat this for multiple directions and then take the corner side so this now gives you a under approximation which is polytopic for the original stochastic reach over set so this polytope would be an under approximation for this set and this under approximation this would be an under approximation of the original stochastic reach over set the one which you use state feedback loss which you don't know which we can't compute because of the cursor dimensionality so this work is uh, it was recently accepted in hscc um so uh, the double integrator these contour plots show the original uh, reach over sets and these are the polytopic under approximation as you can see when we start reducing the threshold value our under approximation becomes more and more closer to the real value because you are uh, for having a high probability of safety you would expect you would need state feedback loss but if you need um, like 0.25 level of probability of safety then you, you can kind of get away with doing an open loop policy and that's what this kind of plot shows and this plot was a unique the novel contribution where we could do the same problem for a 40 dimensional case which was not done before and essentially the reach over sets looks very similar to the chain of integrators and an application problem um, in real world we this uh, use the stock uh, the satellite rendezvous docking problem this is a 4d problem and hence dynamic programming can't be used um but what we have is a uh, closed key will share uh, hill dynamics problem uh, dynamics which tells you how uh, two satellites in a relative coordinate framework interact with each other so uh, if you have a chief satellite and we want another satellite generally for the literature's deputy to dog rendezvous and dock with the satellite then in this in this coordinate frame this dynamic the dynamics of this uh, relative satellite is given by this and this is when both the satellites are in elliptic orbit and you are applying thrust controls to maneuver uh, maneuver it. so um this uh, system as you can see is linear and we, we can apply uh, we additionally add a disturbance of gaussian disturbance specifically to model external forces which as i mentioned before may not be easily modeled uh, in you know may easily incorporate into our model and our objective is to basically stay within this line of sight of core line of sight code because over there you don't have gps so we need a localization um, and that can be achieved only if you lie in the line of sight of core uh, line of sight code and then we want to eventually reach the target at a specific time so uh, we basically were able to compare this with other methods that is the chance consumed method the magenta is our our um, under approximation the yellow is the lagrangian method which is basically um, an alternative method which we proposed use which uses set mesh operation this minkowski sums and intersections to compute this but this approach essentially uh, has a limitation from the implementation side because it uses polytopes and polytopes after such the intersections and minkowski sums has an um as its representation blow up basically you have huge amount of words so um, while it works in some very specific cases it will not generalize properly and an example is this that in the this is the case where 
the velocities were basically set to zero, and you have a position in the x and y direction. Um, in which case, Lavenier method worked. Whereas in this case, the position velocity were minus point uh, one minus zero, I think. So it's somewhere over here, and then starting to be asking the problem: where all can you be in the neighborhood of this so that you can achieve this maneuver? maneuver. And at that point, the Lagrangian method failed. And but, but at the same time, if the Lagrangian method works, it works really well. Like you can see, it takes only 0.24 minutes. Um, the chance consumer method, which was the state of the art before our work, essentially took much more longer than what our method takes. And our method can also work, as I mentioned before, in much more um, generalized cases compared to the Lagrangian method. So in summary, I have essentially discussed three problems. Right? That is basically this compute the forward stochastic reachable uh, probability density, use that to under approximate the reach avoid problem, and then under approximate the reach avoid set. So what we have essentially obtained is a scalability in terms of dimensionality, which was not uh, achieved before. And we are now able to compute these reach avoid sets for even very high dimensional systems. So let me quickly uh, change gears and talk about my future direction, research directions. So, so far I discussed the safety problem. That is, how would you ensure, you, how would you design an autonomous controller that remains safe? A natural question is, are we, can you also be efficient? In other words, if you have the satellite rendezvous option problem, can we pick an autonomous controller that is also fuel optimal, for example? So, in that um, scenario, we need essentially um, a multi-variate, um, a multi-objective optimization problem, which I'll discuss shortly. Another uh, problem which I'm uh, interested in is security in cyber-physical systems. So this problem is basically, um, you, we have an um, adversarial element in, the tunnel, in this mix, and we want to ensure, for example, in a power grid, not have these, uh, this adversarial element drive the system to some undesirable state. So it naturally boils down into a stochastic reachable problem. And now since we have scalability, uh, we can start trying to think about these problems for a huge cyber-physical system. Another important problem that I would like uh, interested in is stochastic motion planning. So uh, this plot which you're seeing here is basically the set of states you should avoid if you, your obstacles are is in um, Dubinska, a classical unicycle model. And this basically, uh, and the way we attack this problem is it's a nonlinear problem, and nonlinear system. And the entire framework that I discussed so far was for LTA systems. So the way we attack this problem is basically by modeling that as a switch system. Uh, and in this case, the model, uh, the, the switching parameter is the angular acceleration. And then we can essentially decompose that problem into a bunch of linear parameter varying systems for which this theory would work. And therefore, we can now easily compute uh, in real time the set of states which you should avoid in order to not hitting a uh, unicycle. And this, for example, would, would have applications in um, like self driving cars or something like that. And we are right now working on coming up with the toolbox which encodes this fluid contest optimization and fluid transfer methods for stochastic reachability and would be releasing it shortly. So the last slide which I had was to just talk about what I meant by safety and efficiency. It's basically, if you have a cost function on an open loop control law, we would want to minimize that cost function while also maximizing our probability of safety, which I've transformed here to make sense here. So, this naturally boils down to a Pareto optimal kind of a curve. So where if you do not optimize for uh, control effort, you can have very high control effort and now obtain 0.85 probability of safety. But now if you're willing to compromise on the safety probability, let's say we don't need all the way to 0.85, we're happy with the 0.8 probability of safety, then we can now reduce control effort all the way from 0.175 to 0.13. And similarly, we can now solve this problem essentially for multiple uh, initial points and then compute the corresponding optimal, con uh, optimal controller for the autonomous sy system, which is efficient as well as safe. So with this, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators and my advisor. This work was supported by multiple grants, and I'll uh, open to take any questions. Thank you. Approximation gives you safety, but through the through the polytope, you're you're under, under approximating it, right? So you're not including every point in the reachable set, right? Yes. Yeah. So what if, so if you're not including every point in the reachable set, how are you ensuring safety? So the, uh, basically, once you have a polytopic set, we have certificate that any point you pick inside the set has uh, a probability of safety at least 0.8. 
So uh, granted, I am not uh, computing all those points which has the probability of uh, safety greater than 0.8. I have now a way to scalably compute uh, at least some collection of sets, so a subset of the original set, without compromising on the safety guarantee. Generally, like the state of the art method so far, we're over approximating this problem, and therefore you would have essentially uh, nefarious points, points which do not have the actual safety being included in your set. This way, you would have. So, under approximation is better than over approximation. Exactly. That's what you're saying. Yes. Okay. That's, 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 and the thing for safety problem, this is very critical. You, we are oh, like a lot of problems. It's okay if you do not characterize all the points which are which are good to work with. If you can at least come up with some alternatives, then we can, for example, talk about efficiency. We could now pick that initial state, which has also efficiency in terms of optimal. You don't have to necessarily be stuck with one point. And that's what this allows us to. Okay, so we'll uh, thank uh, everyone for an excellent talk. Thank you. Very nice. And I'm uh, I'll be here tomorrow also. So if you uh, want to do in this kind of thing offline, I'm so more than happy. He's going to be here visiting, He's set, sitting in the center. Yeah. So we can talk to him. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>